remember being at a, it was when the startup ecosystem nationally met maybe eight years ago now in Sydney, probably nine years ago, actually. And um, there was a push at the time for all focus on startups just to be in Sydney, basically, rather than being spread out nationally. And, you know, everyone from every other city was like, well, very Sydney thing for them to say. My name is Brody McCulloch. I'm Managing Director and Founder of Space Cube. Uh, Space Cube enables entrepreneurs, innovators and change makers. And it's really focused on supporting that community of change in Perth and, and Australia. Um, we set up nine years ago now and have built a range of co-working spaces. So we have all sorts of different spaces for people starting up and growing their businesses, as well as programs like She Codes and Plus 8, Mesh Points that support people on that entrepreneurial journey. So over the last nine years, we've grown from one 500 square metre space at 45 St George's Terrace. Now we've got about seven spaces across Western Australia. Um, right, and all up, it's about 9,000 square metres of space now. So it's grown really rapidly. Uh, about over 1,000 desks as well. And um, lots of different companies using space. So from someone with an idea all the way through to BHP, Google. So really diverse use of the space. Uh, and diverse companies that are using it, which I think is really important to building that cross collaboration between people. Uh, but SpaceCube continues to grow. Uh, we now have moved into a model where we partner with building owners to build spaces and we bring in our technology platform and then can actually grow more quickly and support our members with different types of spaces. Uh, so before, so went to Murdoch University, I did my marketing and e-business degree at Murdoch. Uh, then worked for a machine vision company as, as marketing manager, so uh, industrial cameras in Perth, um, at, which was really focused on, uh, you know, manufacturing lines and using high-speed cameras to essentially like check labels and that sort of stuff. Uh, it was quite early days. I was in early 2000s and then wanted to travel. So got a job working for a cruise line as marketing manager and got to travel all over the world with that, worked with lots of really interesting people and then moved back to Perth in 2010, so you know, 11 years ago now and just saw a big opportunity for supporting entrepreneurs, supporting innovation. Uh, Perth was at the peak of the mining boom at that time and really saw how these sort of spaces and communities were going to be really important in how we both diversify the economy, but also ensure that um, Perth and people in Perth have a great opportunity moving forward in technology, which is just growing as a huge industry. So when we first started, it was there, there was actually a business similar to ours that it had started up maybe two years before and failed within that two years. So I didn't find this out until we'd opened the doors. Um, but it, I think it really came down to the timing. The timing with cloud-based technology was happening so people could work from anywhere. There was a growing technology sector in Western Australia and people building, you know, starting up new businesses. So that was happening a lot as well. So I think it was the right timing in 2012 for SpaceCube to open. But yeah, we went through a whole range of, you know, the, the roller coaster of startup. Uh, I can appreciate that with all the all the entrepreneurs in our spaces because Space Cube's definitely, uh, you know, we've taken on opportunities as, they, as they've come up. Some of those have worked, some of them haven't. But I think that's what we've been able to do really well is move really quickly, take on opportunities as they've presented themselves and ensure that everything we're doing is about supporting our members and delivering more value to our members. Yeah, no, we had a, a few different moments where it was like, oh, this could... I remember very early on, we the, the building, building owners of our first space had forgotten to bill us for air conditioning for about eight months, which early in a business, you know, you get a sort of $17,000 air conditioning bill uh, isn't ideal when you're kicking everything off. Yeah, so when I moved back to Perth uh, in 2010, there really wasn't that much happening. There was e-group and there was uh, Morning Startup had just started, which was you know, six people sitting around a table in a coffee shop in Subi. Uh, other than that, there was some government support, but not really a huge amount. So there wasn't much on the ground. If you're an entrepreneur moving into, you know, wanting to set up or moving back to Perth, they, it wasn't easy to see what was happening. Uh, things have changed really dramatically. Now there's um, all sorts of events. So if you're a young person, you can go along to Bloom and, and go to their events. Um, if you're a researcher, there's SERI which uh, supports uh, researchers to commercialise their ideas. Um, you can then come along to a morning startup event, take your ideas to a startup weekend, access early stage support through Plus 8 Sprint, and then there's seed funding through Plus 8 Accelerator as well. So, so that full ecosystem of support from early idea, no matter what age you are, 
all the way through to, to growth funding and now a number of venture capital, um, early stage venture capital firms setting up in Perth and also nationally there being interest in Western Australia. None of that existed even five years ago. So really it's the last four or five years that things have really accelerated in Western Australia and across Australia. And now we're at a really interesting point where we have companies that started nine years ago, like Health Engine, uh, like Virtual Gaming World, um, whose founders and founding teams and investors uh, are probably going to see returns um, on those investments and, and on that time spent, and ba basically better take all of their experience and learnings and apply that back into the ecosystem, whether it's through new companies, from investing in new companies or working in new companies. So I think the next two to three years will probably be the most interesting where all of that uh, experience, all of that capital is about to flow back through the system. Um, and, and people will be, you know, people who are starting today will be able to benefit from all of that experience, which that just didn't really exist, you know, 10 years ago. Whereas now that's the biggest shift I've seen where there's that support ecosystem in place. And then there's the people who have grown their businesses, now have $100 million, billion dollar companies who will want to put back into that ecosystem. My motivation behind running for mayor was that there hadn't been a mayor or council in Perth for about three years at that point. So it was a completely clean slate. Uh, the city has a significant budget as well that it can use to really um, help drive where Perth goes into the future, both from a brand and narrative perspective, but also from a how it supports industry and the community to decide where it wants to go. So I saw you know, that, that that position was a way to to extend what I'd been doing with Space Cube, which is around enabling positive change through a community and providing another platform to be able to do that. Um, it was a really good experience. I learned a, a huge amount. I think I got, feel like I got a master's in sort of beha human behavior and uh, political science and, and learned a lot, uh, learned a lot about our political system and how it works, which was very valuable, but also learn a lot about people in Perth and business in Perth and what they're looking for uh, and what they want to see next. So uh, great opportunity, um, really was good for me after working, in, you know, it had been eight years of, of just focusing 100% on Space Cubed by that point. So it was a good opportunity to step out for four months and look more broadly at, at where the opportunities were. And, and still all of the things that I spoke about during my campaign around uh, positioning in Asia, you know, in this region in Asia, that growing middle class, um, the opportunities for Perth to benefit even more so now from uh, post COVID, where we've got this safe and secure brand, all of that still stands true. And yeah, it was a good experience to see that resonated with a whole bunch of people, but not quite with enough people through the process. So um, yeah, enjoyable uh, in the future, who knows? I think I'm very focused right now on my business and making sure that Space Cube really is the most efficient way for me to continue to deliver on that purpose. Um, but yeah, who knows in the future, I think there's lots of opportunities. My key skill set, and I learned this through the campaign, was that, you know, that being able to actually drive change and, and create change uh, is what I'm good at, but, and ran on a campaign about creating change. Part of the challenge was coming off the back of COVID-19 is that people really wanted things just to stay how they were before. So, so I learned that probably the hard way um, that people, you know, and you saw it through the, the locking down of the borders, people really wanted things to stay how they were. So a change message really it wasn't the right time for it, but there'll be a time in the future where that that is the right message and also we're going to need to change what we're doing. So yeah, I think governments can learn a lot from startups, particularly around how startups are just ultra focused on their customers. Um, so governments, thinking of citizens as their customers and the ones that, you know, that they pay them, they pay the taxes sort of thing. So I think that's something that we can see a real shift in is how governments approach working with citizens, look at how they co-design policy and, and work with the people that are going to benefit from those policies. We've started to see this through things like the NDIS, which is a flip of the model to make it customer focused and the customer being in control of, of their destiny. Um, so I, th I think that's begun, but it's not widespread at the moment. There still isn't that view of citizens as the customers and, and that are there to be served, uh, not from what I've seen from a broad perspective anyway. So, so I think from startups live and die by finding customers and supporting those customers and building new innovative products for those customers, I think that's a, a lesson and an opportunity for government to take that approach and, and use that 
methodology um, through Lean Startup or all the different methodologies to, to better serve their customers, which are citizens. I, I think from a stereotype perspective, there is still a perception that there's not really that much happening here beyond mining uh, and energy. Uh, I think that's probably a common, common view nationally. And I remember being at a it was when the startup ecosystem nationally met maybe eight years ago now in Sydney, probably nine years ago, actually. And um, there was a push at the time for all focus on startups just to be in Sydney, basically, rather than being spread out nationally. And, you know, everyone from every other city was like, well, very Sydney thing for them to say during this meeting. But I think that's there's still that perception that there's just not a lot happening elsewhere, and especially in Western Australia, when you know, that's just not the case. There's a huge amount, huge companies being built, um, lots of lots of investments starting to come through. All that that ecosystem has been built over nine years, and uh, I, I think that's sort of not recognised nationally. And also, you know, everyone here's just had head down and focused on doing the work rather than necessarily talking about it nationally. Um, so I think that's probably a, a big difference and something that we we haven't done a good enough job from Perth, not just in the startup community community, but across the board. You know, there was an article a few years ago now in the New York Times about how amazing Perth and Western Australia is, but we didn't really leverage those opportunities to actually build on that. So I think that's probably the, the thing we've missed doing is how do we set up that narrative for Western Australia and then communicate that to the rest of the world? Because we are ideally positioned now, COVID's shown that, you know, we, we, our brand is really strong globally. Uh, our economy is going really strong off the back of the, the iron ore boom at the moment. And I'm sure as soon as international borders open, tourism is going to be a, a big component of that as well. And we've got a lot of tech companies that are, that are growing here. So, so that for me is we, we don't tell our story well enough in nationally or internationally. Uh, and we don't have a cohesive narrative about what, what's happening here that we can communicate. So they're probably the things that we can do a lot better at. Yeah, so I think Perth uh, is going to grow quite substantially due to where it's located in the world. So we talk about the time zone and the you know the size of the population within that time zone, and we don't West Australia Australia doesn't really even do much about that. We we don't build those relationships like we should, uh, considering this is where most of the population growth is going to happen over the next thirty years. So, so I think just because of demographics and location, Perth is going to grow, and therefore all the opportunities for people in Perth are going to grow as well. And for um, attracting people here, companies setting up head offices here to access that time zone because we are a safe and we were before COVID, but it's made it really clear it's a very safe, secure, politically stable place. Um, so I think that's the wave that we get to ride in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, I guess it's just it's a matter of how much we take, um, we leverage that opportunity. And I think that's the thing that that's the opportunity that at the moment it's an opportunity for us to miss rather than one that's not going to happen. So I think that's where we really need to focus our efforts to make sure that, you know, if the government's talking a lot about hydrogen, if that's the thing, then great. But we've really got to invest and double, triple down on that. Um, if it's uh, technology sector and health, we've got to invest and double, triple down on that. Uh, because we're in a global race and at the moment, you know, we, we talk about hydrogen in Western Australia as an opportunity. Um, Saudi Arabia is committing huge, hundreds of billions of dollars to developing a hydrogen industry. Same same logic, you know, oil oil and gas, oil and gas, uh, we've sort of got the, the foundations for it. Um, but that investment will put them light years ahead. So, so that's the thing that we really need to do is get that alignment right, work out what we want to become uh, and then make the investments or attract the investments for that to happen. So, so yeah, I'm super bullish. I think just the demographic uplift we'll see in this region will be really good for Perth. Um, but it's how do we leverage that? How do we make sure that things are happening here that you know that support that that growth regionally? Most people might not know I've done quite a lot of travelling. So I hiked to Kilimanjaro and uh, yeah, did a lot of travelling for about that five years stint when I was working overseas. So I got to see a lot of the world, um, meet lots of different interesting people and, and do some fun adventuring things like scuba diving all over the place and, um, yeah, climbing Kilimanjaro, cycling around Japan. So I did that more recently. So, yeah, I've had some good fun adventures globally and, uh, and yeah, but now I have been back in Perth for 11 years, So uh, which... You know, after all of that travel, really realised that this is a great place to, to live and, 
and grow a business. Favourite country? Um, depends what for. I really like Barbados. That was a yeah, really cool, cool uh, island. Um, where else? Uh, yeah, across Africa was really good as well. Um, Spain's really nice. So I don't really have a favourite. <laughs> So the advice I would give is uh, just start networking straight away. That's that's a big one. So start going along to events, meeting people and, and testing your idea off those people. So just asking your friends and family if they think your idea is a good one is not a good strategy to, to success. Um, going and talking to the people who are going to be using your idea and talking with customers, that's really where you need to focus your attention and get real feedback from people. Um, the second thing would be around yeah, validating that idea uh, through prototyping. So, you know, I'm seeing it less and less, which is really good. People spending $100,000 building an app that they didn't actually ask anyone they wanted. Um, so we used to see a bit of that, but there's less and less of that now. Um, so I think prototyping your ideas, there's lots of, of software out there now to prototype an app or whatever it is you're doing to test that there's, you know, to, to go and take that to test with the market uh, in an affordable way. So. Those are the key things, starting to build your team. So um, going along to events like Startup Weekend, uh, meeting people who you can bring, you know, bring around you to form a team because there's very few founders um, that are just solo founders or successful businesses where uh, it's not the, uh, there's not someone with business skills and technology skills or business and finance. You need multiple people. Um, it, it's, there's a whole bunch of research that's been done on on the success rate of startups with solo founders, and and it's it's much lower than if there's more than one of you. And it's that's for support as well. You know, when things get tough, it's not just you having to deal with it. Um, so that's probably the, the three things. So network with people, um, validate your idea with real customers, not not with your friends and family, and then start building a team and get the right people around you to support you. Uh, if you do those three things, you'll yeah you'll you know if you've got an idea, and then you'll have a team to execute that. Uh, which is the starting point and go from there. I'm Brody McCulloch and this is Untitled.